We've been in the middle, we're in the middle here of a, of a brief series on addressing your heart, uh, the heart of the Christian. Uh, when we are, uh, when we get saved, when, when Jesus saves us, he gives us a new heart, and yet much of the Christian's life is working out that salvation with fear and trembling, and a good portion of what the Lord means for you to do in your daily discipleship is... Uh, tend to your heart and pray that the Lord would direct your heart in the right ways. Uh, two weeks ago, uh, we were talking about how we would do that by, we looked at Psalm 119, verse 36, where the psalmist said, incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. The psalmist was basically saying, sometimes my heart wants selfish gain more than it should, and sometimes it doesn't want uh, your testimonies as much as it should. And the psalmist was saying, Lord, would you change my heart? And again, I, we just commended that to you, right? You, you need the Lord to turn your heart in the ways that he wants your heart to be, right? If he wants you to care more about his word than you do, then Lord, help me to care more about your word than I do. And then last week, we were looking at Psalm 119, this time verse 18, where it says, Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of your law. And there we said, well, okay, so we're supposed to, we were just praying, Lord, turn my heart to your word. But sometimes when I open your word, I don't see all the great stuff in it. And we said, well, you need God's help there too. <laughs> you can read the Bible and, and not see the great stuff. Now, there's great stuff there, but you can miss it. So maybe you should, you should all, we commend it to you. You should pray, open my eyes that I can see the great things. I know there are great things there. Sometimes I miss it. Open my eyes that I can see. So, so here we have two, two things that we are commending to you to regularly do in your own Bible study throughout the week, right? Lord, I'm going to open the Bible. Help me to see the good stuff. And, and, and Lord, turn my heart so I want to be regularly in your word. And this is, I would just say, this is part of the regular discipleship you should be engaged in. And today we're adding a third thing that should be tending to your own heart, which is where the psalmist says, unite my heart, give me a heart that wants you, because sometimes we have divided hearts, don't we? We want the Lord and everything the world has to offer. Right? And so woe is us, because that's our struggle. I want what you want and I want what I want. And again, that's, that's just, we struggle with that. So, so just pray that the Lord would direct your heart in a way that's not divided your way and God's way and say, just Lord, give me a heart that just honestly just more and more just wants your way. Like, give me that single heart to want your way. And again, I commend this to you as a matter of prayer. This is a prayer. When he says, unite my heart... He's saying, Lord, I need your help. Now, I think it's right that you should direct your heart. We've talked about this. You should direct your heart to the Lord. But, but if you do it prayerlessly, then you're thinking that maybe you could do it. But when you pray, you know you couldn't do it. But you know the Lord can. And you long for him to give you that sort of united heart for him. Set my heart on you, Lord to be the one I love the most, and may there not even be a close second. Right? This is, this is what we're wanting the Lord to do for us. And may it happen so much in your life that maybe if, if somebody in your family says, hey, let's, let's talk to her, let's, let's, let's try to get her to do what we want <laughs> instead of what the Lord wants, May they just stop themselves and say, you know what? This will never work with her. <laughs> she loves the Lord. And she, there's no way she's going to choose our way over the Lord's way. Right? And they'll just come to terms with that. That'll just be, great. That'll be like the greatest thing. Right? They're just like, don't, don't even bother with her. She, just, she loves the Lord. Now, they, they hopefully will recognize that because you love the Lord so much, you're kind to them and gentle with them and generous with them. Right? You're going to be a different sort of pleasant person that the Lord's making you. But if you're going to if somebody comes to you and says, well, I'm looking for you to choose between us and Jesus, and you're just like, we're not even having this conversation. This, is, this was settled years ago. 
And my heart is the Lord's. Unite my heart. The verse, uh, as John read, says, Teach me your way, O Lord, that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. And again, this is a prayer for a united heart. And a clear indication that only the Lord can give you a united heart. Now, a united heart, by the way, is exemplified a little bit in the opening phrase. It says, teach me your way that I will walk. So there's this idea, right? This is what a united heart looks like. Lord, I don't even know what your way is. I need you to teach me your way. But, but here's my plan. You teach me your way, I'll walk in it. Do, do you see how united that heart is? That heart doesn't say, teach me your way and I'll think about it. Right? Teach me your way and I'll do it. Like, like that's what, now, again, he knows he's not perfect. He does sin. Right? But, but from the get-go, <laughs> just tell me what you want me to do. And, and I mean, what I want to do is that. Like, and I don't even know what it is yet. So just tell me. Like, and maybe it's a good question. Did, did you come to church that way today? Did you come here today saying, I don't know what the Lord is going to say, but whatever it is, if it's the Lord's word, that's what I'm doing. That's what I'm believing. That's what I'm going to do. That's how I'm going to behave. I'm not taking it under advisement. He is the Lord. I am his servant. So teach me your ways because I'm going to do it. Now that's the way of a united heart. The divided heart said, well, think about it. The divided heart might say, what's in it for me? You know, I got plans for me. I got ideas that are what I want to get done. Will this serve my end? But the united heart doesn't ask that. The united heart says, I love you. I love you, Lord. Your ways are wise. And even if it works against my way, (laughs) I'm committed to your way. The Lord, of course, can only give you this heart. We've just said that, but we have to clarify that. When we we do this sermon series, one of the things I most want to clarify is that what we're talking about is this is how Christians should live, but if you're not a Christian, your first work is not to just start doing this, right? So if you're not a Christian, you're saying, I'm not trusting, I'm not not repentant of my sins, I'm not trusting in Jesus, but I'm thinking about doing this Christian thing, so I guess you're saying I should start praying for a united heart, and I would say, not yet. Not yet. See, before you can pray for a united heart, you need to go to Jesus for a new heart. Right? You need to go to Jesus, repent of your sins, trust that by faith Jesus has washed away your sins. Jesus will do this miracle inside of you. He will take out your heart of stone, give you a heart of flesh. And now that you've come to Jesus to get saved, now you can pray that your heart would stay united to him and for him. But, but don't start doing that before you repented of your sins and trusted in Jesus and got the new heart. That's the first step. The Old Testament promised that this sort of one heart the Lord would give us Jeremiah 32, 39, I will give them one heart and one way, pointing forward to what would happen when Christ came under the new covenant. Ezekiel eleven nineteen 19 says, and I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put within them. And these are all promises that the day would come in which the Lord would give these new hearts. And again, we're under the new covenant and we have these new hearts. And again, I just want to tell you, if you go to the Lord right now, if you don't have a new heart, but if you go to him, If you call out to him, if if you repent of your sins and confess your need of Jesus Christ, and by faith trust in Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, you will get this one heart. One of the things we've been saying, though, in this sermon series is that though we get this new heart, it, it takes some tending to, doesn't it? We spent some time, maybe three weeks ago, Pointing to Romans chapter 7, sometimes I do what I don't want to do. Have anybody ex- experienced that? Yes, sometimes I do what I don't want to do. 
So we get this new heart, but, but it still needs tending to. Sometimes we, we do the wrong thing, don't we? So then we, then we pointed to Philippians 2 and we said, well, the Lord says, work out your own salvation for God is at work. So set your heart on the Lord and then, Lord, do the work. Do the changing. Take out the heart of stone, give me the heart of flesh, but also uh, turn my heart, incline my heart to you. Open my eyes to see the glory of you. All right, so you're... You're setting yourself in the direction, but the whole, you're not depending on your work of doing that. You're saying, Lord, do something here. Because honestly, I'm just, I'm just bored when I read my Bible, you might say. Or honestly, I just can't hardly even stand being, uh, you know, at church that much. Or whatever it is, whatever, wherever your heart is. But you know the Lord wants it. You know the Lord wants you here every Sunday. And you're like, but I don't want to be here. Lord, can you change my heart so that I want to be here? So I want to gather with your people and hear your word preached week by week. Can you give me that sort of a heart? And I believe he can. Can you give me a heart to join whatever ministry the Lord is doing here and to come alongside that ministry and just get my hands dirty right beside them and get right to the work of the ministry going on here? Can you give me that sort of a heart? I'm reminded of the call that Elijah gave in 1 Kings 18, 21. How long will you go on limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. Just, like, just decide which way you're going to go. Are you going to live for the Lord or not? But just know there's no other way of salvation than Jesus Christ. John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by me. If you want to go a different way, you do that at your own peril. So the call in this text that is to be wholehearted for the Lord. What, is a, what does a heart for the Lord look like, you might ask? Well, we might say the absence of a heart for the Lord is a heart that's just sort of going through the motions. I, maybe some examples just from the world. If you, if you see a kid and he's up there and his, you know, his, his dad's like, hey, you know, keep your eye on the ball and he's ready to hit, right? And he's just like hardly even trying. You know, you're like, okay, I know what, I know what your heart not in it looks like. It looks like that kid, right? <laughs> he's there, he's trying to live out dad's dreams for him, right? And he's just like, his heart is not in it, right? Or like a man that had a, a business that he loved and the business failed. And now he's going to work, doing a nine to five job. And he just, I mean, he's doing it because he needs to, but he, he just, this is not what he wants to do, right? His heart is not in it. We, we know what our heart is not in it looks like. And again, we describe that a little bit. Sometimes that can look like people spiritually. They know what the Lord wants, but they just don't even really want to do it. So on the other hand, then, what does it mean for your heart to be in it? What does it mean to have a single heart? Well, you don't merely do the work. <laughs> uh, you, you, you want to do the work. You're, 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 you're there for it, right? You, you, you desire this sort of a thing. You're fully committed to doing your best with your heart and your mind, with all your energy. Your Bible reading or your evangelism or your discipling of others or your walking in the ways of the Lord. Uh, all is being approached in a way to honor the Lord because you want to honor him, because you see his, he is great. And you've been helped to see how great he is uh, in the scriptures. And you desire to glorify God in all things, all the while longing for close communion with him. And on and on we can go. We know what a heart, how to describe a heart that's really for something. Just imagine anything you're really excited to do. Your heart is for that. Sometimes the danger, the thing we have to figure out is we have some good things that have our hearts more than Jesus does, and then we're back to why we are here having this whole sermon on heart work. Good things that have our heart, they, they get us energized. What, what, what gets you up out of bed? What are the things you love to daydream about? What does is, what is your heart love? And if it has first place on the throne of your heart where Jesus should be, then you say, Lord, unite my heart to give you a clear first place. Which doesn't mean you can't do the other. It just needs to be put in its place. 
And the Lord can do this. Give me a heart for you, Lord. In Psalm 86, verses 11 and then 12, it says, uh, first, verse 11, teach me your ways that I may walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. Verse 12 says, I give you thanks, or I give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with my whole heart. Isn't that a wonderful way to describe your praise? With my whole heart. A united heart gives you a wholehearted worship of the Lord. Don't you want to wholeheartedly worship the Lord? And the Lord can bring that. But again, a united heart has a prior commitment to do what God says before you even know what God says. That that, that idea actually comes up in uh, James chapter 1 beginning in verse 5. Let's read a few verses from James 1 beginning in verse 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given to him. So if you you don't have wisdom, ask God. That's That's the setup here, right? But ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded, not a single heart, a double-minded man. Unstable in all his ways. Here the situation seems to be wisdom in keeping with God's truth. There are certain bits of God's wisdom that are super clear, right? Don't steal, do love your neighbor, don't lie, right? They're they're, they're super easy. And there's others that we sometimes just pray for discernment. We want to take and apply God's truths to a particular situation. You know, should I do this at, at work? Should I do this in my relationship with somebody else? And it's a little cloudy about which is the best way, but what you definitely want to do is to do whatever God wants you to do. So you say, Lord, give me wisdom for this challenging situation because I don't know how to live that one out. And that's the exact situation being addressed here in James chapter 1, and he's saying, look, you need to ask that in faith and not doubting, not with a double heart. Now, what does that mean? It means something like what we've been talking about already. Do you want God to tell you, let's say you're a businessman and you've got, just got this business decision, right? And you're like, hey, look, I've, been, I've, I've already talked to you know, all the business journals. They say do this. Uh, I've got a, a successful friend. He's got this. Let's, let's, let's listen to God and then I'll take it under advisement. I'll consider having weighed the options before me. I want, God's, I want God to get his say, but then I'll, th- I'll figure out what I'm going to do. Now, that is a double-minded man. And that person ought not to expect to hear anything from God. (laughs) The Lord, if you're going to ask him wisdom, you're going to say, Lord, I want to know the way. And no matter what it is, if I want it or I don't want it, I want to know your way. Because when you tell me it, I'm going to do that one. Do you see what single-mindedness is? It's a, it's a prior commitment to the Lord and his ways, even if his ways contradicts yours, which happens all the time. But don't come and say, I just, I, I just wanted to give you your say so that I could say yes or no later. Psalm 27, 8. You have said, seek my face. And my heart says to you, your face, Lord, do I seek. The psalmist is interacting with the command, seek my face. The Lord wants his people to seek his face, right? That's that's pretty straightforward. I I don't know if that's on your agenda. The Lord wants you to seek his face. And he's responding and saying, you know what my heart wants? (laughs) That. My heart says, your face, Lord, do I seek. And again, this is, this is just, that's the united heart. The, the united heart is, no, is doing nothing other than looking for God's wisdom. And when he finds it, he's not deciding what to do then. <laughs> he decided what to do before he looked for the wisdom. But we also, so we see the way of obedience there. But I think one of the things that we see there is 
the Lord has commands for our heart. Like, what do you love? Love me with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It's an actual command. So the Lord doesn't just say, this is what I want you to do with your life. He says, this is what I want you to love with your heart. And you're like, I am stuck because I really love this and I don't love what the Lord wants me to love. And I'm saying, well, you're stuck as long as you don't think to confess the sin. Perhaps, perhaps you're stuck because you want to keep loving that. Okay, well, that's a, that's a certain sort of stuck. <laughs> Help me to feel the wickedness of loving this so much that I don't want to pray that you would unite my heart to you. Help me to feel the wickedness of this. So you're sort of breaking down your, actually you don't have a divided heart at this point. You kind of have a united rebellion heart <laughs> and you're just saying, Lord, break it down so, 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 that, so that it goes to you and then just keep on moving it this way, inclining my heart to you and your ways. And this is, a way, again, the way of tending to your own heart. The Lord is not asking you to just do all the things he wants you to do while your heart is far from him. The Lord here then is calling us to direct our hearts to him. I can just give you many examples. I might just give you a few here at the end, toward the end, about how the Lord is telling us he needs our heart wholly for him. Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. We read this earlier. You either hate the one and love the other, hold to the one or despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You just have to choose. He names money, and we'll name it again in a later text, because that's a big one for us. James 4, 4, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world must make himself an enemy of God. And again, it doesn't mean you can't have friends in the world. It's just got to be clear to everybody where your allegiance lays. Who, you're, who, who are you living for? Yes, you must love your neighbor as yourself, but love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength definitely has to have first place. And if they ever ask you to choose, you've already chosen before they even asked. Paul says in Galatians 1.10, Am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? If I'm trying to please man, or am I trying to please man? If I were trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. If you're going to live your life to serve man, you are not the servant of Christ. You must choose. Don't be that rare individual who both loves the Lord and the world sort of equally and kind of keeps that in proper balance. The Lord is saying you cannot do both, and you have to choose, and I'm telling you give your whole heart to me. And make it a matter of prayer. Jesus says in Luke 14, 26, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, and yes, even his own life, he cannot be my own disciple. Again, back to the point we were making earlier. If your mom comes to you and says, I want you to do this, and she's saying do something other than what Jesus wants, you can say, Mom, I love you, but I've decided I'm going to do what Jesus says every time. But your family will do that. Your family will come to you and say, this is what our family wants done. And you're like, well, now I, now I see. I appreciate the clarity. I appreciate the way you clearly said I have to choose between you and the Lord. Because before I was a little confused, but now that, now that you've laid it out ever so clearly like that, now I can see really what's at stake here. You, can, you cannot ask me to disobey the Lord. I mean, you can ask, but it's, it's foolish. My heart is united. To the Lord. I, I get it. Being faithful to your family is something. But if it's at the cost of obedience to Jesus Christ, then you must speak clearly and in love to your family to tell them that they must take their proper place. Well, every time we've uh, gone through this sermon series, we've said we want to end with a grow up together and spread sort of ending. That's, a, that's a, an emphasis on the fact that what we mainly are focusing on in this sermon is you growing. You growing up in your faith. How can you grow up in your faith? Well, do the things we've been talking about. 
direct your heart to the Lord. Say, open my eyes that I can see great things. Lord, turn my heart and set it on you. And Lord, give me a heart that wants you and you alone and let everything else fall to the wayside. That's what the Lord is calling each individual in this room to do. And honestly, I'm just going to say this as clearly as I think about it anyway. I think the spiritual success of this church rests on that happening a lot. And if that's happening very little, we should expect almost nothing here. Even if we had a billion dollars in our bank account, if we had hearts that were telling Jesus no all the time, and that, that's what characterized our people, I wouldn't expect almost any spiritual fruit. But, but what that means is you can't count on your neighbor to do this while you don't. The Lord is calling you right now to tend to your own heart. Stop telling him no. Say, I don't even know what you're going to say, but whatever you say, I'm going to start putting, saying yes. And Lord, I'm going to pray for my heart that it would go in that direction. And Lord, by, by the way, I need you. Because I could never do this on my own. I'm praying the Lord will stir us all up to shepherd our own hearts in exactly this way. But we do it together. Why do we do it together? Because you came here not just so you could get fed, so that you could encourage someone else. So that you could speak a word to them about their need to follow Jesus in obedience. And you can say how hard it's been for you, and, and, but then the ways the Lord has helped you. And you can encourage them in that way. And they can say, look, I can see they're trying to grow in the Lord, and I would like to grow right, like, right beside them. And again, that is what we've gathered for. We've gathered to help each other on the way of living more in a way that honors and glorifies God. If you come for anything else, I don't even know what you came for. Help some, disciple some young person. Help them to see that the Lord hates the way of hypocrisy. Help them to see the Lord hates it when you honor the Lord with your lips, but your heart is far from him. And just look them square in the face and say, I need you to take that seriously. Consider your own heart, young man. Is it far from the Lord? Because the Lord hates it. Teach them to direct their affections to the Lord, just as we've spoken up here in this sermon. But then spread, proclaim the glories of Jesus Christ to those who don't know him. But again, I don't, I, don't, I don't know what you think being a member of a church is, but it's, it's this. <laughs> you're growing, you're helping other people grow, and when you leave here, you don't just be a good boy or girl till you come back. You are an ambassador. Now, you might be the worst ambassador anybody's ever known because you're not doing it and you're not living much like Jesus wants you to, but you've been charged to be an ambassador. So let's all aspire to be more faithful in the ambassadorial work the Lord's already given us to do and gave it to you, well, when you first believed. May the Lord help us and even work in our own hearts. Again, when I talked about unite my heart, like, unite my heart, Lord, to have a heart that is not divided about whether or not I'm going to Proclaim the gospel this week. Just give me a heart that's just right now going to commit to do that. Don't maybe get, oh, I'll think about it. Maybe. Just, Lord, you helping me? My heart is set on obedience. And Lord, you know where my heart is, so you know how much work is going to have to happen between now and when I get out there. And if I were just relying on me, this would be a silly thing to even say, but I know you can do the impossible. Lord, give me a united heart that's not flinching, not dividing over whether or not I'm going to talk about Jesus with my neighbors. May the Lord bless the preaching of his word today. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. for help from your word 
in seeing how far we need you to take us. And it, Lord God, you, you do not call us. You don't expect us to get there on our own. You know we could never get there on our own. Lord, help each one of us to start with a recognition that you are Lord, not us. And a prior commitment that no matter what you call us to do, we will lean on you toward the doing of what you say. Establish this principle in our hearts. A heart that is united to you, your will, your way, your work, by your power. Give us hearts for you. Set our hearts on you. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.